I'm not here as a, as a government official. I'm, I'm really um, want to reflect. I was very fortunate um, a year or so ago to be asked to write an article on uh, from the vet, veterinary record in England, a 10-year retrospective of what do we know about foreign animal disease outbreaks. And that, that was very helpful for me to help sort of reflect on what we've done, uh, how we've made progress, but also to sort of, in a, in a way, kind of establish closure on some of the issues that I think we've all been dealing with. Um, what I'd like to do today is to kind of summarize um, s some of our understanding of how do we uh, evaluate and assess foot and mouth disease outbreaks. How do we see that from the emergency management perspective? Because I think it's different tiers of that. Um, and then to start in, in, in the theme with the conference to see what is public opinion, what's role in that, and um, what experience can we actually reflect on on how public opinion has affected the outcome of various disease outbreaks, and what can we maybe do about that to to make it a, make it better. Um, Thinking of the, the, the traditional way we look at foot and mouth disease outbreaks or foreign animal disease outbreaks is really looking at the devastation at the time, the, the, the very heartfelt destruction of people's livelihoods, um, horrific pictures of, of dead animals, killing animals, um, food that doesn't look very tasty. But when we look back on uh, disease outbreaks, we actually see a rather different picture. This is typically what we see in the short run, uh, in the first few months f during and following a disease outbreak. The long run uh, tends to have rather different implications. And what we see very often is that there's a complete, not maybe not complete, but there's, a, there's some very serious restructuring of the industry and very serious implications for rural economies that happen as a result of these disease outbreaks. Um, before I give my talk, I just want to put a little disclaimer up there. The U.S., because I'm not a critic of, of how we approach things here in the U.S., I am absolutely convinced that if we had foot and mouth disease in this country, we would get rid of it. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind whatsoever. Um, and I think we have a good track record of, of showing that we can get rid of disease. I think the question, though, is, um, and that's really from a technical point of view, the question really is, is that the full extent of the impact that foot and mouth disease outbreak would really have? And I think that's where I'm going to start my talk by saying, actually, and I'm not an economist, but I had to learn a lot about economics to really sort of get a handle on this. The economists don't look at foot and mouth disease in terms of tallies, accounting how many animals were killed, what their value was. They really look at it in these four major cost categories. And I'm going to give you some examples of what that actually means and how that compares with, um, with how we see things in emergency management. And there are really four major categories, transaction costs, indirect costs, marginal costs, and opportunity costs. And I'll give examples of what's meant by that specifically on these. Um, but foot and mouth disease and, uh, is really an economic shock to the system. So agriculture, as we know, it's sticking along. We're, we're, we're producing food. Um, and there's a shock to the system. It doesn't happen that way all of a sudden, and then the question is, how does that shock to the system? How does that ricochet? How does that go? Which direction does that go afterwards? So successful planning, really, for these, for these events really has to sort of focus on this larger picture of <clears throat> how do you minimize the disruption to the system? And that's where public opinion is very, very important. And I, I think that's from the last two speakers I've listened to, it's very clear that there's quite a large awareness of that now. Um, I'd like to overlay that with uh, some understanding from emergency management about how we look at preparedness and planning, and called tiers of preparedness or planning. And the really people look at three different levels. There's tactical planning, which is really managing the resource personnel. How do you get people to the right place? And this is really the focus of how do you manage an incident? How do you make sure that resources are applied effectively, efficiently? Uh, there's a command system in place, all these kind of things. That's the tactical aspects of it. There's the operational aspects of it, which is more the networking. Whose job is it to do what? Which agency? Which pri part of the private sector? Um, how do we engage uh, various groups, agencies, departments? Um, and that's really the operational. And that's what that's kind of gets into the unified response. That's how we all get together and make collective decisions about: Do we want to go with this approach or that approach? Or you know, is is this the best solution right now? Is and, and that's kind of the unified response. But then there's another level, which is really the strategic level, which is generally is, um, and this is how do you, given responsibilities, especially for elected officials, what they have, um, how do they want this to look when it's all over? Because 
disasters are good. We do get over them. And even the worst disasters, we get over them. And, and a lot of people think like that. They, they think like, what's it going to look like when it's all over? And that's the strategic question. And what I like to do is kind of overlay those two thought processes and sort of compare how the transaction costs, like, and I'll get, as I said, we, transaction, indirect, marginal, and opportunity costs, how they relate to different levels of planning and preparedness, and give some examples and show you how that comes out. So here I've got, now I use these bi-directional arrow because really in every element there's a little bit of every cost involved. And the examples I'll give you are kind of like classic examples of, of different things. So let's look at transaction costs or direct costs. That's typically what people talk about. Um, and that's typically the tally that people use. And in a classic example that you see would be a quote from many, many types of publications that would say the foot and mouth disease in the UK cost the livestock industry $2.4 billion. Now, there's a problem with that from an economist's perspective, because if it costs somebody something, it means it was paid to somebody else. So that's where the transaction starts coming in, because what it really means is the transaction of money from one sector to another sector, how much did it cost to move that? That's really what it costs. So a better way to looking at that um, and I'll show you what, why this is important to understand, would be to say, what is the operational outlay, what is the cost of the operational outlay? What did it cost in addition to actually run this operation? Right? We don't have a foot and mouth disease, but you have to deal with it now. How much more did it cost to do that? A good example, maybe the, maybe the, the textbook example of how much an operational outlay was, in 2005 in New Zealand, where there was a credible threat, uh, credible threat at the time, it turned out to be a hoax, that someone had introduced foot and mouth disease to New Zealand. Now here's a country that's prided itself has never had the disease um, and it really is an economy based largely on livestock exports. Um, the response operations simply to get mobilized, to have everybody up there to be looking for the disease, to have checkpoints, surveillance, um, movement control, that in itself, with, in the absence of disease, and that's why it's a classic example, was two million New Zealand dollars. So, and that has to come from somewhere. So that's a transaction cost and really basically went from the taxpayer to everybody who was working on that. Federal compensation uh, is, a, is a good example. Interest on loan is another good example. And here's an example on interest on loans. This, this is an example from, from England, the Moreland Hotel. Uh, so in 2003, and this is quoting from newspaper articles, um, the Moreland Hotel in, in North York Moors uh, closed because it had taken out a loan just ran about the time the foot and mouth disease outbreak, wanted to upgrade uh, and couldn't afford the interest on the loan. It, was, it ended up in a long legal battle with the bank, but basically here's a good example of a transaction cost and the impact of foot and mouth disease on a rural economy. Okay, so someone, someone else is affected by this. There is a, there's a transaction cost involved. Example of indirect cost or really lost revenue, the, again, the m m very good example from, uh, from, the, uh, from England the loss in tourism. Now, why is that a lost revenue in the case of tourism? Was well, because the tourist funding, especially from overseas, wouldn't have been there, wasn't there. If, if there hadn't been a foot and mouth disease outbreak, people would have come to the UK, would have spent money. Um, the fact they didn't come, they went somewhere else or stayed at home, um, that was genuinely lost uh, income. So, Now, the, the challenge with trying to identify indirect costs, lost revenue ahead of time, is you don't always know who's going to be adversely affected. And I think that was one of the issues in England. People hadn't really anticipated the impact on the tourist industry until it really hit. Um, and these are the kind of things that we really need to sort of think about. I know at the time there was a lot of talk about impact of foot and mouth disease in the United States on tourism. I guess we'd have to kind of compare agriculture systems where you have grass-fed lambs and, and beef in England, whereas feedlots, I'm not sure that tourism is really comparable there, but the, there is a definite, definite, uh, definite effect of indirect cost there. And, and specifically when it gets down to the local level, an area called Shambles, it's a very old um, area of, of York, the city of York. Um, and by the combination of the 9-11 attacks, the SARS, the foot and mouth disease, um, basically Shambles, which had been around being an industrial kind of commerce area since the 
I think as far back as the 16th century, and that, that's like these houses you can see here, basically comes to a grinding halt. Nobody wants to go there anymore. It's a, it's a huge problem because now you have what was a big economic driver. All of a sudden, you don't have that anymore. So that's an example of lost revenue. Marginal cost um, is a little bit more difficult to understand, but if you think about it in terms of it's the cost of doing more. So um, I always think as a veterinarian, if you're running a practice and you want to have more, you want to see more clients, and that means you either need more staff or need to put in more hours, that difference to what you're already doing, that's the marginal cost. And uh, in animal disease can program, control programs, um, surveillance is the marginal cost. And surveillance can actually be quite expensive. If you look at the US BSE surveillance program that we have, we wouldn't have had that. We, d we didn't have that until we had BSE. So that's a cost of doing more to prove that we have, that we're free of BSE, that we wouldn't have had if we'd never had the disease. So here's an example of a marginal cost resulting from a, um, a disease, uh, disease program. And, uh, and, and if you look at this, is, you can look at these in more detail, because I think we're going to put these up on, on the web for you. But this, this is examples of the marginal cost when I was still an employee of USDA. And I, I've shown these before, John, so there's nothing to be worried about. But if you look at the non-indemnity cost of the response to various disasters, and this is the Washington AI outbreak, the BSC case in Washington State, um, the uh, AI case in Texas, and um, the Newcastle disease outbreak in, in California, you can see that the marginal cost, the cost of doing more to get rid of these diseases, was about 25 to 90% of the total cost. But none of this never features in these examples of the cost of the outbreak was so and so because we only ever count the number of animals lost. The, op, the, the marginal cost is actually quite significant, and in, as you can see, in some cases, actually the larger part of the cost of an outbreak um, than uh, the actual disease, the operations itself. Um, and then there's this thing called the opportunity cost, and related to the opportunity cost is the um, return on investment, the opportunity cost is that given that we have a finite amount of money and a finite number of choices, if you put your money here versus there, which one is going to be more beneficial? And um, so we've got choices. And this is when it starts getting a little bit more complicated, because the choices we make in a disaster or in a foreign animal disease outbreak are not only important at the time, and maybe tactically might be very important, but looking down the road can be very much larger in implications than at the time. And so the opportunity cost and the multiplier effect resulting from that is a very significant aspect of disease outbreaks. And I'm going to give you some examples of exactly what that means. Um, the, uh, yeah, so, so, yeah, so it's short term lockdown. And here, here's the example of, of opportunity cost. Um, and we know that the England had, had these tremendous burial sites, and um, there was also the cost to, to the, this. But one of the numbers that keeps coming up is that the UK, um, as a result of slaughtering all the animals, actually paid a quarter of a billion dollars less in export subsidies than had they not slaughtered the animals. So actually, here you have a negative opportunity cost, which is, if you look at the numbers, is Kind of part of the tally as to how much it costs to kill the animals. So in fact, the opportunity cost for England was, was nearly zero as far as the impact of foot and mouth disease. Now, people don't really want to say that because it doesn't sound like really good. This disease outbreak didn't really cost us very much to the agriculture. Um, it did cost a tremendous amount to the country as a whole. Um, but there's an example of when you kind of see that you have a choice of keeping the animal alive and paying direct export subsidies, not a good thing, but they were doing it, or killing the animal, not paying that export subsidy, there's a savings there. Um, a better example, or, or, or not a better example, but another example is the, um, what do you do with these burial sites? Because I think once all these animals were buried, um, kind of people, kind of the story kind of got superseded by other events, but let's have a look and see what happened to some of those. There's a couple of them I've been able to follow for probably about 10 years now to see where they are. So in, here's one of them, which was the uh, Great Auden Airfield. Um, 2001, nearly half a million carcasses were buried there. Cost about 12 million pounds to build. Um, 
So there's there's your transaction cost. You know, someone's someone's that twelve million dollars, that twelve million pounds went to somebody. <laughs> Uh, maybe not in agriculture, but something went to somebody. But in 2006, so five years later, um, there is still a cost involved. There's still uh, 240 metric meters, so that's, that's what's that, like 10, 5,000 cubic feet of runoff a week that needs to be taken care of. And that's costing the government 850,000 pounds a year to maintain. There's a huge expense involved in that, which has never factored into any of the equations that I've seen about what the cost of the foot and mouth disease outbreak was. But think about this. So here we are in 2006. That means that they've spent another you know, $4 million just on maintaining the site. And there's, there's an example, opportunity cost. Now, the opportunity cost comes in that somebody is getting paid to do that. right? And so if you're in the waste business, you know, agricultural waste management, maybe that's not a bad line to be in. right? But I'm not sure if that's really where we want agriculture to be going. So th that's the question here. Uh, another one was Ashmore uh, uh, in Meath, Devon. There's another burial site. This is actually an old quarry that they thought was going to be a good, good place at the time. 2001, buried about just short of 200,000 carcasses. Took about 7.5 million pounds to build. And there's a long story of what was going to happen with this one. In 2003, Ashmore, this is a quote from one of the local newspapers, that Ashmore is to be restored to farmland. Right? So it was farmland, it was grazing land before that. But in 2006, um, they still have problems very similar to the airfield, that they have considerable expenses in maintaining security, runoff from the site, um, and, uh, and maintenance on that. So that one didn't look so good five years later either. So again, we've got some huge costs involved in these, and I think these are the kind of issues that we need to be thinking about as we go forward. To amplify the, uh, the example I was using on opportunity costs, um, there is this other factor that economists look at, which is called the economic multiplier effect, which is generally in, in very coarse terms, they look at four sectors of, of the economy, agriculture, industrial services, and construction sectors, and those have multiplier effects, and there's much more detail than that, but they have multiplier effects. And the question is, if you put a dollar into agriculture, how many jobs does it generate and support, versus if you put that into industry versus services versus construction? And these are the kind of questions that come up in um, disasters. I'll give you an example from unrelated to foreign animal diseases, but when you have hurricanes come through the Gulf Coast, there's a whole lot of developers standing around the edge saying, where the house is down because we see a business opportunity here. And their argument is invariably that they generate and support more jobs through construction than what was there in the first place, orange groves, for example. Um, and it's a very important one because I think these economic multiplier effects are often driven by, and the choices for opportunity choices, opportunity costs that we have in disasters are driven by public opinion. And that's what I'm going to switch to in just a second to show you how public opinion has not always been where we want it to be. And then the question is, how can we kind of shape that public opinion going forward? So a good example, um, just on a tactical level, using thinking about multiplier effect, what's the best way to manage the response to a foreign animal disease outbreak? Is it best to have uh, government folks work on that? Or is it best to have contractors? contractors their private sector, basically if you're paying them, they're supporting jobs, they're spending their money on good things. If you're supporting government people, um, they already have jobs um, and you know maybe they don't even live in that community. So here's a good question about where the opportunity cost should go and where the better uh, economic multiplier would be. <clears throat> so let's look at some of the long-term outcomes. It's not all bad. Following up on the Moreland's Hotel, by 2012, they had gotten over their legal battle with the bank. Um, they were under new management, and now you can actually look them up on Yelp and Travel Advice, Trip Advisor, and this kind of stuff. It's actually as thought of as one of the best places to stay in Yorkshire. Um, so, you know, like I say, there's elements of all of these costs involved here, but um, the folks that were in that dilemma at the time didn't know this was going to happen 10 years ago, and the question is, if you think about ourselves now, if we had foot and mouth disease today, where would we want to be 10 years from now? That's really the question. If we look at the economic recovery in the Shambles district of uh, York, um, 
It became such a problem that there was an economic stimulus package that was put that way. Um, it is again now an international tourist destination, and it was highlighted, for example, with marching the Olympic torch through that area. The shop window I showed you before that had everything closing down, everything has to go, is now the Earl Grey Tea Rooms, fancy place to go and have a cup of tea. Um, so again, um, things do turn around, and sometimes disasters actually become more of a stimulus. But there we have the economic multiplier effect. What it looked like at the time, what does it look like five to ten years later? Economic recovery on Ashmore Meath is very interesting because that saga continued. After it was first going to be farmland and then it was still a waste site, in 2010, really quite by surprise, a private donation um, to the National Trust of over a quarter of a million pounds to help boost the fortunes, quote unquote, of a number of fritillary butterfly species on Dartmoor changed the dynamics, and by 2013, it is now a national heritage site, a national um, trust site. National trust is like the um, Nature Conservancy here in the United States. Um, national trust sites, which is now open to the public, and it's a picnic area where people can see lots of fritillary butterflies and birds and everything going on there. So, but what, what has happened here is it's a long, drawn-out fight, nearly 12 years to really get this resolved. But what happened here is we went from agricultural land to waste management to more legal fights now to a national trust. So there's a huge shift in what happened in that area. And what we don't know in the long run is which one really ended up the better. But I can assure you there's lots of happy people that can walk on these premises, walk on through the fields out there now. The question is, could they do that when it was agricultural land? We don't know. So if we look at again at the slide I had earlier, what was then a bi-directional arrow. I hope I've tried to make a case now to show that the transaction costs, the direct costs, as we typically tally them for disasters is kind of like the tip of the iceberg. And the lost revenue, the marginal cost, the opportunity cost, that's when the impact, especially over the long run, can be very, very substantial in foreign animal disease outbreaks. So let's think about what would happen here in the United States. Um, again, some time ago when I was um, at USDA, I had the fortune of heading up a, an exercise on foot and mouth disease working with the Economic Research Service, and they freed up a few nanoseconds time on their mega computer that processes something in the order of 17,000 economic parameters simultaneously. They can tell you what traffic jams are going to be like if there's a pothole in the road. It's, I mean, it's really pretty fascinating. And what we did is we took a real county, a real rural county in the United States with real economic data, uh, and we simulated a foot and mouth disease on 60 farms. So not a lot of farms and not a lot of animals because the farms we picked, we really did generate them. them we picked them randomly. So some of them were large, some of them were small, some of them just had one or two animals or something like that. And then based on the economic parameters that we could then put into the model using, at the time, the current APHIS recommendations for controlling the disease, stop movement, killing animals, um, how, much, how would that impact that one county? Not the country, not the state, not international trade, just that one county. Um, and the model came out with some pretty precise numbers. It said the operational cost to do what it takes we have written up in our guidelines at the time would be $1.4 million a week. It would need 750 personnel. And the local impact on the economy, this is not related to agriculture, simple, the local impact on the economy would be it would re reduce that county's tax base by $6.4 million a week on the gross county product. Think about that in a single rural county, $6.4 million a week. Um, and in one year, that county would have lost over 700 jobs from food manufacturing, 1,500 jobs from retail, 1,100 jobs from hospitality, and 1,200 jobs from health and social. And species not affected by foot and mouth disease because of the stop movement would be impacted as well to the tune of nearly quarter, three quarters of a million dollars. So this is just looking at if you take a real county, you simulate a small disease in real farms, you implement the procedures, and now you can start seeing 
having given those examples of the tactical cost, the $1.4 million, the, um, the relationship cost, the operational and now the strategic cost, this would have huge impacts on that one county. And this is really what I see is, and, and what I was most concerned about, what mo motivates me most about my interest in foot and mouth disease, the impact it would have on rural America. Um, it would be devastating, absolutely devastating, and I think here's examples of that. So, trying to bridge now the theme of the conference um, of um, merging values and technology and the different topics that I've seen on the agenda, I'm going to give, give you some examples from, in, those, in these five areas, environment, animal welfare, food safety, economics, and biotechnology, um, that have played a role in disasters or we anticipate how they would play out in disasters. So bear in mind now we're really talking about opportunity cost and multiplier effects and because this is where the rubber meets the road in terms of choices that will be made that will affect the future of agriculture. Now I said at the beginning that the two previous speakers, and I hope I can do them both justice because they're very excellent, trends that are occurring will accelerate during a disaster. And the challenge that we have strategically is to get ahead of that curve. I think um, John said that very well. You want to get ahead of that curve before it starts like pushing you into where it wants to go. And, but the trends, and we want, to, we want to identify what those trends are and we want to make sure that we have a really good handle on what they are. So let's have a look at some examples in those five areas, what the outcome, what the issues have been and what the outcome has been when a foreign animal disease strikes a country. Um, let's have a look at environment first of all. In 2006, uh, avian influenza outbreak in the, in the Netherlands, uh, the public was very concerned about the amount of manure produced by chickens for a product that is essentially exported from, from the Netherlands. I mean, the Netherlands, I think, I can't remember the exact numbers, but something in the order of 60 to 70 percent of their poultry is exported. It's a tiny country. Um, and the public was you know, quite understandably saying, well, why don't we just get rid of all these chickens? I mean, they got AI, we don't want that anyway, and we don't want the manure, so why don't we just get rid of all the chickens? And then we don't have the environmental problem. Um, the, uh, and, but what really, the, the discussion about the environment and the role that agriculture plays in that really doesn't touch in that context, and maybe it's because it's a very built up country, but it doesn't touch on the, the opportunity cost and the marginal cost of agriculture on that land. I mean, what else could be done with that land than using it for agriculture? Is, is, it, is it going to be built up? Is it going to be a factory? Is it going to be you know, another dam? Um, you know, that's really the question that comes in here. And I think that's one of those, the, the discussion that we really need to start having um, to, to do this, uh, to, to really get a, get a handle on the environmental issue in, in disasters. In Taiwan in 1998, when they broke with foot and mouth disease after being free for quite a long time, the public, uh, public movement convinced the Taiwanese Environmental Protection Agency to issue a moratorium on restocking livestock, restocking swine. Um, the conditions were they either had to build a three-stage closed lagoon system, basically treat farm runoff, farm, farm manure, the same way that we treat human sewage, uh, or they had to relocate to another area. As a result of that, and it's kind of a long story because then they got free of foot and mouth and broke again. It's a long story, but they, Taiwan's pork industry has really dropped off by about 40% since then. Um, and that's really the net effect of this. And I think from our perspective, I think we have to be very concerned about the potential for court injunctions, for moratoria, for uh, should we have to depopulate a CAFO? Uh, because the, as, as I understand it, the, in, in discussing this with some attorneys, the legal environment changes when the animals are gone and the environmental impact has gone with them. And whether we would be able to restock our farms could be a very significant issue in a foreign animal disease outbreak. So something to really think about. I think there's precedent that that actually has happened in other countries. Um, let's look at animal welfare. Public opinion, and this is gross simplif simplification, but Public opinion sort of thinks that animals kind of should roam free and be happy. And um, there's, there's some really interesting claims out there about how much space each individual animal should have. Um, but um, 
But when you think about what happens to animals in disasters, the animals that are in their natural environment, and it actually is probably a statistic to, to which is probably true, there's more animals that's, that suffer morbidity, mortality, being in their natural environment through disasters every year than from disease. And the reason for that is because we house them and we take pretty good care of them. Yet at the same time, the public doesn't see that connection. They think animals should be out there having a good time, um, and they will give intensive agriculture or even um, uh, uh, agriculture in general, they still criticize agriculture for the way we raise animals. And so there's a real, I think, a real conflicted view in the public as to how we deal with animals and what they think is acceptable. And you think of tens of thousands of cows that dies in blizzards uh, not, not too long ago in, in, in the southwest states. You think of all the animals that die in floods. Um, there's a lot of animals suffering because of the way they're kept in these natural environments. So again, I think if we have a foot and mouth disease outbreak, I think how the public views animal welfare and how we treat them, I, I think we've got some conflicting views that we really need to get a, a better handle on. Food safety, and I'm certainly not a food safety expert, but I think it's really sort of interesting movement that we see that growing the sort of locally grown lo or locally sourced food, organic food, and the preparation of foods, and if you go to DC now, probably a lot of cities, you see these food trucks with all sorts of exotic foods sold by the roadside, um, which is all fine and dandy um, for those of us that can afford them, but it doesn't really address the bigger issue about um, what does it cost to produce food, who can afford to buy the food, what is the safety of the food, and what's the variety of choices for the food. And I think that's a much bigger issue that all sounds very good if, if, you know, if, you, if you're pretty well off and, and you can you know, buy whatever kind of food you want, but if you don't have those choices, which, might, which is actually for many, many people is, is not the case, I think that argument kind of gets lost in all this. And so what's happened with, with food safety and disease outbreaks? I think there's, there's precedent to know from a number of um, disease outbreaks that we can potentially suffer loss of consumer confidence in food. Um, and I think that going forward, especially with foot and mouth disease, which is really purely an animal disease, um, I think we've got some tremendous challenges ahead of us with risk communication on why are we killing animals to save animals. I think it makes it's acceptable, and I think we can make a good story by saying we have to kill animals to save humans. And I think most people would go along with that. But I think when you start killing animals to save animals, I think it's a, it's a, diff it's a hard sell. And I think that the public is going to resent that, and I think we've seen that in England, um, and I think we've seen that in other countries where how, how, how do we really resolve that? And I think we really need to get a handle on that before we have one of these outbreaks. Um, because the public is going to, simply going to ask, why do we do it? It's interesting, in the foot and mouth disease in England, the Maasai, who believe that they own all cattle, asked for all their cattle back from England because they saw no point, they have foot and mouth disease, they live with them, they saw no point in killing animals to save animals. I know it's just a fascinating perspective because it's really kind of, you know, it, it, it's real. You know, people really don't, don't, don't understand what we're doing. Uh, on the economic side again, and I, again, I'm not an economist, but I've done quite a few studies on trying to understand um, what the economics of, disa of disasters and of trade are. Um, we've got sort of, again, sort of, somewhat uh, divergent opinions on what the public thinks and sometimes it, I think the quote is it's in it for the money or trade protection is good but I think there's another way to look at it and that is meat is actually in high demand worldwide and we are on the supply side of that. Uh, economic efficiency is really the key to sustainability um, for, for any business, agriculture as well. Innovation has always provided, especially in the United States, the competitive advantage over many other countries uh, and we need to maintain that. And I'll show, give you examples of why disease-free partners, that means animal disease-free partners that we trade with, are better for our exports. So let's look at meat consumption. Probably most of you are familiar with a study done by the um, International um, Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRI, in Washington uh, several years ago. This is the livestock revolution that basically looked at the trend in um, meat consumption over 25 years from the 1970s to the mid-1990s, that basically worldwide, and this is a log-log chart, um, the, the demand and the consumption of meat is increasing throughout the world. And um, 
so this is this is a this is something that's happening and and it's happening mainly for fish, pork, and poultry. You can see that that's the largest, fastest growing sectors demand for for these products in the world. And when we see how the how those different uh, meat types are being produced, they're really being produced in industrial systems and they're really being produced in the Asian part of the world. And this these these are this is this is really the way it is. And this is not only the way it's going to be projected forward into uh, another 20 years ahead, but it's also the way it's been for the last 20 or 40 years, that actually, even though we think of the green revolution as being a major revolution, the way crops are grown, the actual um, standardized um, production index for livestock has actually always outperformed crop production over the last, since 1971, which is they first started recording that. So uh, meat demand is very high. Um, and uh, we have to somehow supply that. Now let's look at some examples on various disease outbreaks. And these are some studies I've done looking at um, the impact of these connected um, livestock production with feed, feed supply. So in, in uh, Taiwan in 1998, so they broke, this is and to say for the first time, but it was a good study because when I finished this in 2004, they were still free of foot and mouth disease. Because that next year they broke again, but you know, that's another story there. Um, but if you look at this year, our, Taiwan um, is principally supplied by the United States with soy protein. I mean, that's, that we, we have always been their principal supplier on that. And prior to the outbreak in um, 1998, uh, average um, supply of protein, uh, soy protein was 6.5 million metric tons a year. It's, it's, it's it's sizable, it's sizable. When they broke with foot and mouth disease, um, again, you have this moratorium, you have a decrease in the number of hogs being fed, the, the shrinking of the livestock industry. Demand for our products decreased by 11%, down to 5.8 million metric tons. That's a huge drop in our exports. And the issue that we have with that, and this I originally had this as one of these examples of marginal cost, our problem with that is that all of a sudden we have a million metric tons with nowhere to go. And we have to find another market for that. And that's not cheap to do because Taiwan was a regular customer of ours. How do we find another market? What are they willing to pay for it? Um, but you can see this is a real event for, for us and not just uh, – this, this, I mean, there's a particularly good example because the United States export markets, but you can see that – we suffered a significant loss because another partner had a disease problem. Um, if you look at um, many years ago when Syria was still somewhat stable, um, Syria actually became free of foot and mouth disease um, around about 2000. It took about two years to really establish freedom of foot and mouth disease. What's really interesting here, again, if you look at the lower part of the chart here, again, we, are our their, we were their principal feed grains supplier. Um, prior to having foot and mouth disease, our average supply per year was about 220 uh, metric, 220,000 metric tons. Relatively small, but still significant. When they became free of foot and mouth disease, our exports increased threefold to 660,000 metric tons. So it's a huge benefit to our agriculture in general to see a country becoming free of disease. They have a better value-added product. They have um, better producing animals. It's worth it for them to put uh, to buy more feed to make a better product. What's interesting is if you look at the top curve, this is the cattle population in Syria. You can see that actually after the foot and mouth disease, the actual number of cattle dropped off. And the question, why would that be? Well, the reason why is because now they're going more into a beef market. They have a more efficient system. And they can produce a better quality, more of it, with less uh, um, cattle to start with. So very interesting dynamics how that occurs. Um, but it's really beneficial to everybody when, when we become all free of disease here. There's been some discussion about um, trade with South America and whether how, how that would impact the United States. And an example of why people are concerned about that is because when Uruguay, again, looking back historically, we've had some outbreaks as all of South America is becoming free of foot and mouth disease. But back in the mid-1990s, when they really became free of foot and mouth disease for the first time, you can see that their exports to, of, of uh, 
of beef increased to FMD-free countries, um, but it also increased significantly to FMD-infected countries. However, in the long run, their market shifted to FMD-free countries because being FMD-free themselves, they could export to higher value markets, and that was the general trend. And some people would say, well, that bringing it to the United States, but I would argue that if you look at where that beef went to, that that was never really a big issue for us. So this is just looking at trade statistics for the 1990 and 2000, so basically five years apart on either side of becoming free of foot and mouth disease. In 1990, um, the uh, Mercosur, that's the, um, the rest of the South American, the southern cone of South America countries, um, that was their principal export market. The United States was a substantial market and lots of other countries as well. But when you see when they became free of foot and mouth disease, at the time much of South America was infected with foot and mouth disease, exports of those countries dropped off, exports of the United States dropped off, but exports to other countries in the North American Free Trade uh, uh, Pact actually increased, so to Mexico, Central America. Um, and so it really wasn't a problem for us, and um, I think this is another good example of disease, fr freedom from animal disease is actually beneficial to everybody. It, it, it improves everybody's um, bottom line. And a, a final example in where I've looked at the world in terms of our countries infected with foot and mouth disease or are they free of foot and mouth disease? Um, if, you, if you look at this chart here, so everyone on the left uh, of the chart is free of foot and mouth disease, and everyone, all the countries, the 80, that, that's 84 countries, 86 countries that have foot and mouth disease infected. And these are countries that, was, that have been in that status for some time, um, so between 90, uh, 1997 and 2001, so there's not changing status here. The, where it says cattle and pigs, that's the n total number of animals in those countries. So you can see that. The most of the animals in the world actually live in foot and mouth disease infected countries, by far the most. But if you look at the next two columns, feed grains and soybeans and meal, that's our exports to those countries, and you can see that the vast majority of our exports go to foot and mouth disease free countries, not foot and mouth disease infected countries. Again, why is that? It's because that's an opportunity for them to have a better value added market, um, and with that demand for meat, um, that's what they really want to have. So again, another example where I think it's sort of helpful for everyone to be free of foot and mouth disease. So just to sort of wrap up the economics here real quickly, um, what concerns me, and I think we have precedent of that, is that when we have very narrow views of animal economics, I think we kind of undermine the many benefits animal agriculture actually has for the world. Meat is a desirable food worldwide. It adds value both to pasture and to feed grains. Um, it creates lots of jobs. Um, and, uh, and especially in the export market, numbers that you see in many, many studies from many, many countries around the world, every million dollars of value-added export supports about 5,000 jobs in that country. Not just the United States, but you can go to any country, it's very similar s statistics for that. So in general, I think, um, thinking in terms of the economics of agriculture, animal agriculture, I think we need to sort of see that there are many more benefits than, than our Biotechnology, um, uh, again, how, how, do, how does the public look at biotechnology? On the one side, we have terms like frankenfoods, and we have um, the lots of very heated debates about um, genetically modified salmon that we have down here on the bottom right, but we don't, with the same gene mutation, we don't have a lot of discussion about the different sized poodles. And these are actually... As far as I understand, I'm not a geneticist, so I can just disclaim that, but they have the same gene mut mutation. The difference is that the salmon was artificially introduced, the poodles were bred. Um, and the difference between those three poodles, and I did study this because we, we once had a cow when I was a resident that was just ginormous, and we started looking at her uh, growth hormone receptors on our liver, and she just had huge amounts of them. And that's the only difference in these poodles. They have different numbers of growth hormone receptors on their liver, and if they have very few, they're tiny, and if they have a lot of them, they turn into a big poodle. Um, and, but the, the, the concern I have is that we've entered sort of the realm of, of, of the, you know, nearly the twilight zone on dis discussion of some of these issues, because these are, these are both scientific, 
th these are testimony of scientific progress. One that we accelerate and we control, and the other one that we do somewhat slowly, but it's also very controlled. And I think that there's some real adverse outcomes that we can see from that. Um, and this is where I think that, again, where public opinion has a lot to do with how we make our choices and how we frame how we want to prepare for foot and mouth disease. The media, again, they're on the supply side. They want to have a lot of stories that sell. And they sell stories that are about crises and sensations. I mean, we're all glued to the story on, on Boston. And um, it, it's a critical event in, in our history. Um, but that's just one disaster, and a few months from now it's going to be something else, and then it's going to be something else. And you know, when they go on about stuff about sequestration, and they try to make a disaster out of it, I it's like it's it's not very interesting. Um, <clears throat> but the um, uh, but and then and then you see the kind of um, the type of reports, when speci specifically when how the media sort of portrays agriculture and uh, or, or science in general, in, and the lots and lots of stuff reports on the connection between vaccines and autism, that, that really there's no scientific basis to it. Um, the food safety aspects of genetically modified organisms, really, again, lots and lots of discussion about it with, with very little scientific sort of basis to it, and uh, as, as well as the what the real risk of threat is from diseases from animals. And if you see, I think there are real outcomes from the way that is reported um, and the and the really the unscience that goes into that. Um, you see growing resentment, not just in countries like Pakistan, Nigeria, against vaccination against polio for various reasons, you know, American conspiracy to sterilize their boys or something like that. Um, but you see this in North America where parents are developing resentment against vaccines. Um, this, is, this is a real scientific dilemma that we're facing. And I think if we were to face a foot and mouth disease outbreak, people would question what's the value of vaccination. If they're questioning the value of vaccination of um, measles in their children, are they going to accept eating beef that's been vaccinated against foot and mouth disease? Even though we vaccinate against lots of other things, do they? How does the public really see that? And I think that's what sort of gives me real concern about where do we stand with science. Um, and how do we how do we support science from an agricultural perspective? Now, how do we how do we address all of that? And so, there's, I've given you sort of this is how we um, traditionally look at the cost of foot and mouth disease outbreaks, foreign animal disease outbreaks. This is the sort of economist view of it, which shows that there's a lot of elements that we don't really consider. This is the sort of these are the public opinion influences that we've had on on various disease outbreaks around the country. So how do you how do you wrap all that together? Well, there's a there's a whole I wouldn't say it's new, but I think there's a, a very interesting approach to try and identify what are the issues and what are the driving forces affecting the issues, and it's called systems mapping. And it's not really all that complicated, although the the systems maps itself can be very very sophisticated. But what you really want to do is to map out all the influences, all the drivers, all the opinions, and figure out who really matters in all of this. And everybody matters, but what we don't really have is because we don't have a systems map, is to what extent do they really matter? And I think this is important because as the examples I've given, you can see that when there is a lack of preparedness on the environmental front in a disease outbreak like in Taiwan, the environmentalists will get their way. When there's a discussion about vaccines and how valuable they are in children, vaccinating animals might not be an option in a foot and mouth disease outbreak. Not because we believe in it, not because it may be the best solution, but simply because the public doesn't say, you know, this can't be good. Um, if there is discussion about trade is not good because it doesn't support jobs and, and this kind of stuff, that's not good for us to have this. So mapping out what are all the different components is really important thing to do. And, and, it, um, and here's an example of a systems map. So I call it what's for dinner. And so these are just the same examples what I said before, where every one of these aspects contributes to abundant high quality food at the end of the day. Um, and each step is necessary to get high quality abundant food on the table, but not one of them is sufficient to do that. Right, so the independence of systems. So this is a very simple systems map. And you say, well, what are the environmental aspects? I mean, what, what really matters today, tomorrow, 
10 years from now in the environment to make sure that we continue to have abundant and high quality food. And, and the same with food safety, economics, biotechnology, and animal welfare. I think that's our challenge. I think we need to really map this whole system out. And I think that from what I've seen of the conference and the agenda so far, this is really kind of maybe the first, one of the major first steps in that direction to doing that. A systems map is a strategic tool to identify interests that drive choices for the future. We know we've, we've got precedent of what those choices might be. We've got foot and mouth disease. Any kind of crisis is going to create that vacuum for people that want to have their agenda felt. And to show you that this is really not a new concept, a couple of examples of whether you look at a shock to the system as a crisis or an opportunity. One unrelated agriculture from Peter Loscher, this, who became the CEO of Siemens, and um, there's a different issue altogether. Siemens was tied up in some bribery scandal or something. But here's a quote from him uh, talking about using a scandal to drive change. But as I always remind anybody who is listening, that's an interesting statement right there, never miss the opportunities that come from a good crisis. We certainly didn't miss ours. Scandal was created by a sense of urgency. Without change, would have been uh, would have been more difficult to achieve, regardless of who was CEO. Seems a very proud company of its history, innovation, success. In the absence of a catalyst like this, people would have asked themselves, why alter anything? So here's somebody who kind of walked into a crisis and said, this is the time to really get Siemens back up and running. And Siemens continues to be one of the leading uh, energy companies in the world. David King, who was a science advisor to Tony Blair, was much criticized for some rather simple, dorky looking charts that he put up in the foot and mouth disease app. And he said, this is why we have to kill all these animals. Whatever the rationale was behind that. Um, David King also did something very spectacular, which I thought in, in that disease outbreak, is that he used that disease outbreak to further the agenda of science funding. And for the following 10 years, um, science funding in the United States really justified by the need for more graphs and charts and better understanding of agriculture increased in the order of uh, 5 to 6 percent a year in the absence of other budgets going down. So again, here's a, here's a sort of master of disaster who can say, well, yeah, whatever, I mean, this job might look do dorky, but I have an agenda here. I want to increase funding for science. And that was the opportunity to do it. And that's, I think, what we need to do, too, when it comes to foreign animal disease outbreaks and agriculture in general. To me, this is a crisis of science and the, the rationality of how we do this. If we look at public opinion had of animal agriculture in the past, whether people know it or not, they will sympathize with these views. We have eradicated brinderpest, which is a sensational scientific accomplishment. I mean, it's, it's, it's really one of the greatest things that, that we've done in, in animal agriculture. We've developed vaccines, including for rinderpest, but think of how we were able to um, farm the Midwest here and then going further to West. We were only able to do that because we had vaccines against equine encephalitis, which made it possible to have these 20, 30 horse-drawn plows and combine harvesters. Before that, the mortality of horses was so high that we couldn't actually farm the land effectively. Many of the clostridial diseases were developed in, in, in animals uh, and have saved countless lives in humans, tetanus, botulism, these kind of things. Um, environmental health field hospitals in Vietnam, they, what a lot of people don't realize is that there were many more uh, fatalities in Vietnam from infectious respiratory disease uh, than from injuries originally until they consulted with, with dairy barn specialists who basically put up cattle sheds that had proper air turnover. And all of a sudden the respiratory rates and the respiratory uh, infection rates went all down and you know people could actually focus on treating the wounded instead of dealing with pneumonias. Food safety, HACCP, is just one of the again, one of the greatest processes we, we have to create one of the, the, the safest food supply in the world. Um, th these are scientific accomplishments that we have. And last but not least, I always like to remind my physician friends when they talk about herd immunity, that is a veterinary term and they still are talking about people. That's a concept that comes from veterinary medicine that when you reach a certain level of immunity in a herd, the disease kind of starts dropping off. And it's a, it, again, it's a great contribution that animal agriculture, I think, has made to all of this. Looking forward to the future, 
what do I think are the major areas that we need to be focusing on? Well, we've had some fantastic presentations here, and I think we're all on the right track. Like I say, said before, though, these trends, if we don't start taking a more um, proactive role on public opinion on the way the trends are going, these trends will accelerate in a disease outbreak. Um, we've seen that over and over again. What I think the things we really need to get a handle on the tactical side of things, what is the tipping point for interventions? What I mean for that is at what point um, is stamping out, up, up to what level is stamping out killing animals, is that the best approach? And at what point do we not do that anymore? It's a, there's a tipping point. Is it, is, it, is it one animal? Is it 1,000 animals? Is it 10,000 animals? Is it really for everything? Or is, it, is there a point where we need to say, OK, stamping out is not going to work. We have to go over to a different approach. Live with it, vaccinate it, whatever it is. What is that tipping point? And I think that's a very important point because that's a, that gets into the key um, messaging at the time we have a foot and mouth disease outbreak as to why are we doing something now versus why are we doing something later? At what point do we change that? And as, as John said, the, the public doesn't want to be surprised. If we can tell them ahead of time we're going to do this, they'll accept it, more likely accept it than if we just sort of spring it on them. Um, disease countermeasures using information technology. Um, it just never fails to baffle me what you can do at an ATM or with an iPhone. And, you know, we have um, microarrays for detecting disease, and there is technology that you can link the microarray to a cell phone that could dial to a, an exclusive number, for example, a diagnostic lab, um, that only the diagnostic lab would actually have the results. You know, that, this, is, this is technology that's sort of out there for a lot of things already that would really sort of help us with communicating disease presence. If we had a positive, the lab could send somebody out. Um, you wouldn't have to have somebody on site. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity out there. I think um, uh, we've heard it before that, that the social media is really changing the dynamics. We need to think about how we can take advantage of that. In general, I think we need to be proactive on the discussions on the contributions of animal agriculture to greenhouse gas emissions, water use, carbon sequestration, re renewable and biofuels. And we need to work towards what I think we're calling now transformative sustainable agriculture system. And not, not least of all, we should be concerned about human nutrition. You know, everybody thinks you, know, you are what you eat, and we produce what you eat. And so I think we need to really make that connection between um, human nutrition and, and, uh, and agriculture, and we need to frame it in scientific terms. To uh, wrap this up, um, I just want to say again, the, the, we need to be concerned that looking back on, on a retrospective of animal disease outbreaks, they will lead to restructuring of rural economies. The big guys, well-financed guys, well-connected ones are going to get bigger. The small guys are going to drop out. It's a, it's, and I think it was said earlier, it was a great quote, those with lifestyle choices may not have those choices anymore. Those with good financing connections are going to do, do quite well. Um, we know from avian influenza outbreaks in Asia and Italy, foot and mouth disease in the UK, there's significant con consolidation of all of those agriculture sectors in those countries following those disease outbreaks. The small guys dropped out, the big guys got bigger. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just simply saying these are choices we have now to think about how we want to manage that going forward. And here's a specific example of, again, a, a couple that had a farm. These aren't obviously the very old buildings. It's a farm that goes back again to the 15th or 16th century continuous farming, originally called uh, Rexon Farm. In the foot and mouth disease outbreak, they lost everything. Um, and they really kind of scratched their head what to do. As part of what was then renamed as an economic stimulus package, the Devon Renaissance, they renamed their farm to become the Wolf Valley Business District. And you can see they've converted basically um, their um, agricultural sheds, their farm sheds into, into business district. But what they're really trying to provide, because they do more than that, they have converted their farmhouse into a, in a, in a sort of bed and breakfast re re retreat and they use the agricultural, the rural setting as an inspirational setting. And I think going forward, we again, we really need to think about the impact of a foreign animal disease outbreak on those local rural economies and whether they would be able to continue, uh, um, continue their lifestyle and their lives going forward from that. So I hope I've given you lots of examples, something to think about. Um, 
There's foot and mouth disease. Here's the, the way we've looked at them. This is how we count costs. This is the impact of the cost. These are the different levels of planning. Strategically, um, I think we've got a lot to think about.